The world of Elden Ring is full of things that are horrible and strange. If there's something strange in your neighborhood, who are you gonna call? You should probably call a Belmont. And since we already did Alucard, let's just keep things consistent and do Trevor from the Netflix series. On my quest to find the most fun build in Elden Ring, I thought it would be fun to whip up a little monster hunter. To watch these runs live, follow me on Twitch. To support me with money, join my Patreon. And to get started, let's get cracking. In character creation, I started out as a warrior for the stats and made our Belmont as grumpy as possible. Just because I'm having a good time doesn't mean he will. Look, he's already jumping off a cliff. What a downer. In Limgrave, we get a crafting kit from a speaker merchant, a horse from Greta, a whetstone knife from a hole in the ground, and the strength tier from a bowl someone left in the grass. Were they having a picnic? Come on, clean up. We slam Alexander from behind until he gets a release from his hole, then go to a church for some holy water. If we want to play the game as Trevor, we need to really feel like Trevor. So after a few shots, I came back and rode around Stormvale Castle to learn him. There's a few smithing stones and silver feet on our way to the whip, but we got warped to Belmont Castle first. I grabbed the recipe for blue magic bombs, but we won't end up using them because I forgot. Consumables are pretty bad, crafting is a chore, and the damage is worse than weapons you don't have to craft. Whoops. After getting the Dexterity Physic tier, we have 20 extra levels worth of damage for our fight against Hoslo. Pretty important since we haven't actually leveled up at all yet. Hoslo is a whiny brat using our family whip and it kinda carries him. While whips aren't great in general, they stand out in PvP for keeping people at a distance. This one even has bleed. We managed to make our way in and grab that Belmont whip. With a bleed weapon acquired, y'all can guess where I'm going, it's time to hit Grail. On the way, we just grab a few runes from some graves, it's not like the dead people were using them, then we start whipping the bad dragon for a huge load of early runes to invest in vigor. I'm not sure exactly how many runes it is, if you're curious just google whip bad dragon on your work computer. Right next door we can grab the Dectus medallion piece for later, I figured out a pretty consistent early game trying to keep this section shorter for y'all now. I'll point out if something funny happens along the way, like overshooting the elevator in the Raya Lucaria crystal cave and almost taking our first death, saved it though. Other helpful tip, just kill the miner in the room with the shortcut, that way you don't have to get Gatling gunned. Downstairs, take out the Crystallion, it's weak to strike damage, which is what the whip deals, so pretty free. That'll let us buy Smithing Stones 1 and 2 to level up the whip. Now imagine Trevor Belmont in Fortite. Fighting the Fort Knight will give us the Bloody Slash Ash of War, then we can grab the second piece of the Dectus Medallion to get into Altus and scoop up the Smithing Stone Bell Bearing 2 to buy Stones 3 and 4. Remember when I said whips were good in PvP? Translates to NPC fights as well. Nerd Juice and Patches are free. Now now we can make gold pickles for 30% more runes every time we kill a boss. All that went fast, but now we need to slow down and farm for the Kaiden armor. I assume it's pronounced like Raiden because they love riding on horseback. As is tradition, we counted with Pokemon and I got it on number 34, which is Nidoking. That's pretty average luck, it's a 1 in 33 chance and that's a statistical rule that you'll get at one number after the average. For more information, google Nidoking, rule 34, on your work computer. For more early errands, the Poop Cave and the Clean Rot Knights. Since we have the early vigor, we do fine. The whip even hits both of them in one swing sometimes. That's pretty fun. We can summon our boyfriend to fight Margit with us, and Alucard is dealing great stance damage with his floating swords. Summoning help increases the amount of pressure you need for a stance break, but Glint Blade Phalanx is so good it doesn't matter. Stance breaks in general don't matter though, because we can't crit with the whip anyway. Fun. I got killed by some Ballistae on the way to Gilka, pretty embarrassing, Gilka is way less dangerous. Killing her gives us the Ritual Sword Talisman for 10% more damage at full health, pretty good on just about any character. Our last errands will take us down to Castle Morm, can't play a Castlevania game without going through a castle, that'll give us our normal whip. We're not getting a second Hoslos, Trevor uses one spiky and one smooth. As long as we're in the Weeping Peninsula, might as well grab some Sacred Tears and then cry because we knocked the Golden Vow Knight off the cliff. Turns out the Ash of War was still there, so we boost our defense and offense with the push of a button. Now I think we put these whips to their intended use. Domination. Gostock was sweet enough to open up the gate to Stormvale, so we say thank you with some whipping. Some people would pay good money for that. We storm that veil and head right into Godric. We could summon Nefeli, I think Trevor would appreciate a beefy lady, but that would also beef up Godric, so instead we'll just solo him. Honestly, we just kind of kept hitting him, there's not a lot of strategy to it. In phase 2 we got a stance break, but that means nothing for us, whips can't crit, they're pretty bad weapons, I'm worried this run is going too smoothly and some of you might think that they're good, we win, but trust me, in a PvE playthrough, whips are bad. One of my favorite 
other regulars, Nelm wanted me to fight Exicus, so I just did it. If you want to tell me what to do, become a cool regular in my chat. I aim for the head, that's the coolest way to fight it. I don't know why, but the whips are worse at hitting dragon heads than fists and claws. I do my best to avoid the rot, but end up getting rotted anyway. It's probably going to happen while you fight Exicus. While the stance break technically doesn't do anything, we can hit the head a lot easier and get the bleed. Those extra runes. Definitely not bad. Time to take on Star Scourge Radon with the boys and Theralina. With the crew together, I Golden Val and they Golden Plow. We get a stance break and roll over this dude. He jumps up into the air and I revow. He kills all my boys and maybe Theralina, but I didn't want to risk getting squished without them. Look at that. The boys are back in town and Theralina. All together, we get the kill thanks to the power of these boys. But if we want to be a bisexual icon, we have to find a girlfriend immediately or we will lose our bi license. Time to go find Sypha. She's under the unsightly catacombs, which are full of gargoyles who squish us pretty quickly. Whoops. I found the lever and opened up the boss door to take on Perfumer Trisha and the Misbegotten Warrior. Trevor has killed plenty of werewolves before, but it's best to take out the speaker magician who keeps buffing at first. She has like no health, but he just won't let me get those hits in. Eventually we're able to wear her down and we can focus on that werewolf. It's the boss of Morn Castle where we got the whip, and I think there's a reason. Its base poise is pretty low, so the whip is a great way to stop it from attacking. Pretty neat game design. Beating those will give us the perfumer Trisha Ashes, a lady who casts spells and wears breathable fabric. Sypha is on the squad. But leveling Sypha will require a bit of that good kush, so let's do a quest for a witch. Up through Carrion Manor, we have a quick bout with Loretta. While she can't bleed, we have enough HP to just sort of trade damage until we win. Then we talk to Ronnie, head to Nokron, fight the Mimic Tier. It's an NPC fight, so that's free with the whip. Even though we got crit somehow, I was trying to guard counter and lost stamina. Down into the Knight's Sacred Ground, scoop up the Great Ghost Glove Wart. Then into the Einzel River Main, say hi to Phalanx, from Demon's Holes, get the last of the glove wart we need to make our girlfriend a perfect 10. She already was, but now she is statistically. Time to take her someplace nice, like the capital, maybe. Can't be like the nights in the summer, in the city, in the summer, in the city. Dates are expensive, so we need some more runes first. Grail is pretty easy, you just have to whip and avoid the fire. Then avoid the fire again, then avoid it again and again. More fire, huh? Still more? Just one more, and there we go. That took forever. Before heading for that draconic tree sentinel, we level up the whip and the sword we grabbed from Alucard before he took a long nap. I made both of the whips bleed, but something happened right before I recorded this run. They nerfed the status effect buildup when you're power stancing, which is already rough, but considering how slow the whips are, this is really rough. While the Draconic Tree Sentinel hits really, really hard, Sypha can give us an Ice Shield that will reduce incoming damage by 90%. It's basically the Opaline Bubble Tier. She doesn't always do that, but does it enough for it to be a nice buff. It takes a while to get the bleed going. Eventually, we do, like right before it dies. Lindell time. Erd Tree Avatar is pretty easy, though our whips are really starting to fall off in terms of damage. They're still good at getting around shields, though, so I killed the Lindell Knight instead of letting him hit me with a Lightning Bolt. I equipped the Ritual Shield Tower before heading in to fight Godfrey, we've had an extra pocket for a while. Since this is just a g -g 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 ghost it's immune to bleed. I used the occult whips instead. Here Sypha shows us her biggest issue. She doesn't really do much like at all. One of the three or four attacks she actually does gets the final kill, but she spends most of the time with her shield up. More on that later. Let's head into the sewers now. No better place to take a date, I think. Make sure you know your way around, though. If you accidentally fall down a hole, it can be a bad time. I managed to get out and even avoid the omen to get up the ladder and open the shortcut. Good thing I did. The lobster at the bottom of the sewer nearly took us out. I'm pretty quick, though. Now it's just a brief trip through the Lindell Catacombs, a horrible maze that makes it seem like you're going backwards. It's just like a Castlevania map. At the end of the maze, we take on Esker, one of Dracula's priests. He's pretty easy, just kill the dogs first and enjoy the Lord of Blood's Exaltation, which will boost your damage by 20% after you proc a bleed. It's one of the best talismans in the game, so I wanted it as soon as possible. But also, the Godfrey Shade can't bleed, so I waited one boss and grabbed it before we took on Morgoth. Because of that status nerf, we don't get a bleed pop until we're in phase two. But we've got help from Greta and Sypha, so it's not that bad. Just avoid the blender and wear him down. Greta wants to burn down the earth tree now, let's go do it. We might have to deal with some cold weather but that's why we have a puffy coat we're happy tonight walking in a winter wonderland see you 
Oh, after we kill a putrid avatar, or I guess die to one, then kill it. Only three deaths, still pretty good. We scoot through the Forbidden Lands and ride up to the mountaintops of the Giants. What a lovely time. The Bell Bearing 3 is right there, so we can level up all of our weapons some more before we fight Borealis. Normally, I would just ignore Realis, but I was realizing we were going to need two streams to finish this anyway. Might as well get the extra runes. Maybe I should have ignore Realis because I got killed by the Roar Realis that comes out fast and locks you in place to get Frostbite comboed to death. Next time, I made sure not to get locked underneath it, and it goes better. On to the Fire Giant. Despite our low damage, we're able to break that anklet pretty fast. We even get a stance break, but we can't do anything. You can never do anything with a phase one stance break though. So for once, it isn't the whip's fault. Phase two is a go and I'm just hanging between his legs to try and get a bleed off. Of course, if you're hanging between his legs, you might get slapped by the two big red balls, but I made it out. Another bleed and we win, letting Greta burn down the herb tree. Into Faramazula, which exists outside of space and time, very important to know. We fight the Godskin duo and it goes pretty well. I bring in Sypha, she puts the defense buff on me, and I managed to avoid the rollout. We kill a skinny one, then a chunky one, and Sypha dies. It's just me and Burning left. His big snake hammer gets us a stance break on skinny so we can whip it for the bleed. When Chunky comes out and starts rolling out, I hop up on a column and have enough reach to hit it without getting hit. Another score for the whip. Then another chunky and skinny and we win. Nothing too interesting happens with these. They drop the last bell bearing so we go max out one of the whips, but we need another ancient dragon stone so let's go fight Garonk, who is definitively Malakat. If you complete his quest line and listen to his dialogue, it should be very clear that he is 100% Malakath. When he dies, he leaves us a voice line asking why Marika betrayed him. Malakath was Marika's shadow. Some people like to make corrections on lore, but if you're gonna do that, make sure you know the lore first. Anyway, Dragonsmithing Stone 2 acquired. It's been a while since we went to the castle, so let's check out Castle Soul. I just sprint past the lines and open up a shortcut. I don't want to take any more time fighting Nile than I have to. This dude sucks. His soldiers suck too. They killed me pretty much instantly the first two times. But after that, Nile is still not easy, especially not with the whips. He takes advantage of their turtle slow recovery frames and nails you with huge follow-ups that deal huge damage and come out absurdly fast. We died three times to him, and once to the elevator that I forgot to send back up. Still below 10 deaths at the end of the first stream. That's a solid start. That's just one piece of the Halleck Tree medallion, so let's get the other half from a dying old man. Then we can go to Winter 2, the Consecrated Snowfield. The Putrid Avatar here is worth a ton of runes and will give us the Thorny tier, which boosts combo damage. We'll need that later. For now, we make an octopus fight a dragon. That's my favorite part of the Castlevania series. It didn't work the first time, but the second time worked like a dream. Another huge chunk of runes and a third ancient dragon stone to level up our sword, also going to be important later. There's another worshiper of Dracula, the Penguin Noble. It's like a sanguine noble, but colder. Once he's dead, we can head to Dracula's castle and take him on. That should be easy. Belmonts were born to fight Dracula. We blew Skidoo into Mogwin Palace and grabbed the Hallig Drake Talisman without issue. Aren't we supposed to be invaded? I'm not complaining, I'm just confused. I made it through the cave unscathed, but forgot we need a tear from killing Carmilla. She's pretty easy at this level, way easier than she was for Darth Maul last week. Dracula time. The bleed is okay. This is basically the same weapons we used for Poison Ivy and we beat Mog on our first try. But the status effect nerf hit really hard. And even more importantly, we don't have the Dung Eater as our Spirit Ash, we have Trisha. Trisha is not helpful here. Spirit Ashes have a set list of moves they'll use. Trisha has two different fire perfume tosses, the buff she gives us, and unfortunately for this fight, holding up her shield. From what I gather, the shield command stays active for a set amount of time until the shield is hit. Normally that's pretty good, it keeps her alive in the fight, but for Moog, it means she spends most of her time not doing anything except holding up a shield while he beats the hell out of us. And boy, does he beat the hell out of us. A lot of his damage is fire though, so I made a quick detour to the Dragon Barrel Cave after we died twice and fought the beast men of Faramazula. More werewolves, they drop the Flame Drake Talisman plus two, which will drastically increase our fire resistance. I also leveled up the Rapier, thinking I could save our bleed procs for phase two. Other thing you might not know, every time you apply a status to a boss, it takes longer to apply it again. So if I get two bleeds in phase one, phase two mob will fly around and reset that meter faster, meaning we're way less likely to get the bleed. Unfortunately, the whips are just really, really slow, which means the blood effect is going to be so much worse. Moog is just so aggressive. Everything has a hitbox. Even him pulling the trident out of the ground 
has a hitbox that will deal about a third of our HP. Love that one. The rapier is working better, but it's still pretty rough. We just keep dying over and over again, so I'm gonna try a new strategy. For that, we need some new items. First, we're gonna go take on Commander O'Neill. He's a little weaker, rottier version of Nile. Then we can boogie up Celia, cure Millicent, and pick up her arm at the Shaded Castle. Hey, it's another castle. And kill everyone on the way out. It wouldn't let me work. We'll meet up with her at the Moon Knight Village and fight another Godskin Apostle together before murdering her for the Millicent prosthesis, raising our dexterity by five and boosting our damage. It'll stack with the Winged Sword Insignia. You can't get to the Rotten Insignia and Millicent prosthesis in the same playthrough, so I'm stacking these instead. Clean Rotten Knight is the only thing standing in the way. We've already killed three. The fourth is not hard. Still, it wasn't enough. I was just too attached to using the whips to activate the bleed, and to be honest, the sodium levels were obstructing my vision. If I were calm enough to think straight, I could have realized that I needed to put the bleed on the rapier instead of the whips. Sure, a cult has more raw damage, but since it's a single weapon rather than something power stance, we'd be able to get a ton of bleed procs off, while also getting a fast combo going and boosting our damage back up with the Lord of Blood's exaltation. I figured that out after dying to Moog 24 times. Oof. But eventually, we got Dracula dead. Now, everything seems kind of anticlimactic. Today's rest of the story. Once upon a time... Swamp, Bird Run, and the Draconic 3 Sentinel. We trade damage because the whips are slow and he's fast. It's pretty standard at this point, and I'm gonna try and avoid using the sword until we get absolutely wrecked like we did against Dracula. Malekith time, he's alive here because Faramazula is outside of space and time, so it doesn't matter that we killed him in Grail. We get the bleed in Phase 1, avoid the flip in Phase 2, and Sypha keeps us stacked up with those good buffs. Honestly, she's really helpful in most fights, as long as we don't need a distraction. One more bleed, and it's on to the Ashen Capital. I totally forgot St. Germain learns spells from the bosses you kill, so he has Moog's Blood Flame. Not a huge issue. Remember, whips are great against NPCs. I always try to clarify that most builds are good at something, even if they're not good at everything. So this one's very, very good against NPCs. It's very, very bad against big, fast bosses. Like Godfrey, we summon Sypha and get the bleed before phase 1.5 comes out with the giant AoE shockwaves. We get another bleed, but we're stuck there for a good long while trying to find a way in. Phase 2 starts and I mess up fast, getting grabbed twice. Really embarrassing. Sypha tries to give us some defense, but that's not enough. Daddy Godfrey rips us in half. Second attempt, let's use the rapier. It's faster, it does more damage, it procs bleed faster, it's just better in pretty much every way except reach, I guess. Sypha does die right at the beginning of phase two, but we're able to get Godfrey down after phase 2.5 starts, which is great. I really hate phase 2.5. We take a quick detour to grab Godric's Great Rune, boosting all of our stats by five, which means 15 extra levels of damage for Radagon and the Elden Beast. Of course, we use a Cult Whip since neither of them can bleed, and Sypha is giving us nice consistent buffs. That's pretty huge since we're going to be trading hits to get a lot of our damage in. It works really well. We even dodge the Hammer Slammer and whip it up to get to the Elden Beast. I'm using the Rapier against the Elden Beast since, I mean, Trevor does use swords, right? So I should use whips and swords. I used whips against Radagon. I'll use the sword against the Elden Beast. Can't complain about that. I will complain about the camera betraying me during the flamethrower, but we live. Tries to grabs, but I remember training against Godfrey, so I don't get grabbed. Sypha gets killed by the rings. I swear that move exists just to kill Spirit Ashes. Still, we're able to get some combos in going pretty quickly, which means our damage will escalate very quickly. We even avoid Elden Stars and Elden Rain at the same time. That leads us to a first try victory against the Elden Beast with 7 hours and 12 minutes of in-game time, 32 bosses slain, and 34 deaths. That'll put it right next to Batman, tied using the metrics I use, but we're gonna go right behind it. Batman was my fourth run. I shouldn't be dying this much anymore. Really, we suffered from slow weapons and the whips, which generally don't work well against bosses. Even excluding Moog, we weren't killing bosses quickly, even if we weren't dying nearly as much. For a PvP build, go nuts with the whips. They're very fun. Against most bosses, though, they're not great. A single sword is probably better. If you like this video, subscribe for more. We got more Elden Ring videos coming up. Follow me on Twitch to watch these runs live, and join my Patreon if you want to give me money, and follow my other channel if you like Dungeons & Dragons. I make characters over there, too.